And he goes, well, tell me, like, Days of Thunder, is that like, is that kind of like how it really is in, in your business? And I thought, oh, how am I going to explain this <laughs> to this guy? <laughs> you know, I don't want to knock it down completely. And I'm like, well, and then it dawned on me. I said, so tell me, Top Gun, is that like it really is in your business? And he goes, all right, I get it. <laughs> You're doing great. Okay, this is the team guy and a young Jimmy, the young driver. Go. Don't overdrive the car. The suspension is getting loose. Damn it. Don't overdrive the car. <laughs> the rear is drifting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to It's Not the Car, the only motorsport podcast that won't judge you for lying about how you drive. Unless, of course, you lie in a way that isn't funny, in which case we'll judge you a little, but never to your face. I'm Sam Smith. I'm a journalist and a club racer. I have a new book out this month. It's a compilation of my writing about cars for car magazines over the last 20 years. It's called Smithology. You can find it on Amazon. Jeff, who are you? I'm Jeff Brown, and I am currently the competition director at AWA running the GTD Corvette in IMSA. Ross, who are you? I'm Ross Bentley, and I'm currently barely awake. But I'm going to try to stay awake for the rest of the day here. So, uh, but yeah, when I'm, when I'm awake, I'm a driver coach. That's good. Are you a driver coach also when you're asleep? You're not, you're not coaching when you're asleep? Well, sometimes, but shh, don't tell anybody about that. What I dream about. I dream about it's coaching people. When you're asleep. So we run different formats on this show every episode, largely because, um, now oh, I don't know. Death is an unknowable constant in the universe and existence is a never ending cycle of terror and pain or something. But also, primarily we do this because we like mixing stuff up. And the format we're using today is something, it's a new one. It's something we call, it's not the car movie club. And in this one, we're going to pull apart a racing or a car related movie that car and racing people maybe know of, seen, haven't seen. And then we'll talk about it afterward. But I'm going to run through the plot, taking a little bit of background on it. And today we chose to start, I wanted to, Ross and Jeff were, Ross and Jeff, when they heard this were basically like, no, it's awful. I hate it. I hate you. I'm never doing this again. This podcast, giant waste of time. I'm going to take my toes and go home. But we're going to start with Sylvester Stallone's 2001 force majeure epic, Driven. It's possibly one of the worst films ever made. It's definitely one of the worst racing movies ever made. Stallone wrote the script, he produced it, he starred in it, and he's gone on record as saying he now regrets making it. It was directed by the guy who directed Die Hard 2, Die Harder, a dude named Rennie Harland. He also called it the biggest mistake of his career. Sorry, the biggest mistake of his career. Uh, it starred Burt Reynolds, Gina Gershon, Robert Sean Leonard, three people you maybe have heard of, maybe not, and a lot of other people you have almost definitely not heard of. And it was made about IndyCar in the late 90s, about Champ Car, because Stallone had spent some time in Europe while he was making a movie called Judge Dredd, which incidentally was also terrible. Maybe you're noticing a theme here. And he decided that racing was neat. He initially wanted to make the thing about Formula One. That didn't work out, partially because Bernie Eccleston, Eccleston is was Bernie Eccleston. He also wanted to make it at one point about Ayrton Senna. That didn't happen either. So in the end, he made it about this kind of big giant sandwich of sadness with some Indy cars in the middle. And it, it just turned out, it, it, you need to watch it if you haven't. It was made on a $72 million budget. It turned $32 million in profit in theaters. The whole thing has the vibe of a Michael Bay flick written by a dog who was in a room while like Top Gun and Bad Boys played once as cameos by Mario Andretti, Jacques Villeneuve, Juan Pablo Montoya, Tony Kanan, Mimo Gidley, Max Pappas, Dario Franchitti, a whole host of others. And the tagline on the thing was, welcome to the human race. Now, Ross, Jeff, before I get into the plot here, I'm curious, what in a sentence, what's your, what's your knee jerk on this? Ross, what, what do you think of this thing? So I think that it's important in our lives that we <laughs> see what bad is because it helps us understand what good is. But I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I got any other closer perspective of what good is by watching this. All right, Jeff. I, I, I thought when it was going to come out and they were going to make a racing movie, I thought, okay, even if it's bad, any racing movie any movie about racing is good for the sport because I make my living in the sport. That'll be good for the sport. So any racing movie, even if it's bad, will be good for the sport. 
Yeah, I retract that thought. That is, <laughs> that is not how it worked out. Hi, I'm Sam. We make this show because we like it, but also because it keeps our young producer, Mike, off the street and away from a life of crime. If you want to help both of those things happen, you're luck. We have this thing called Patreon. For a few bucks a month, you get to help support the show, but you also get some neat perks like monthly bonus episodes. The money we raise through Patreon helps keep this show on the air. If you like what you're getting here and want to help us keep doing it, that'd be great. If not, that's fine too. We like you anyway. You're here. We're glad. Join at patreon.com forward slash not the car. Back to the show. <laughs> yeah, okay. it, and Sam, you know, I think so. So Stallone said that he regretted it. I regret that Stallone made it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so just just so you know, we're not going to spend the whole podcast bashing on this thing. I I happen to have an, an odd love for this terrible terrible movie. Generationally, I think we're, we, there's also a generational split here. You know, m- a lot of people my age. So I'm 43, and a lot of people my age and younger love to hate the thing and love to not not necessarily hate watch it but watch it in the same way that like i don't know um you watch cartoons where somebody gets hit over the head with a concrete block over and over again so the the background on this thing is really interesting and what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of why stallone wanted to make it a little bit of what the movie itself is like and a little bit of of why these movies do or don't work and why there have been so many terrible racing movies and by terrible racing movie you can unpack that, right? That's on the one hand, you have terrible movie, the things that make a film unwatchable, groan worthy, uh, not realistic and, and just pain. And on the other hand, you have the things that make a, a racing movie bad, which could encompass everything from none of it's believable for people who know something about the sport to it's not believable for people who don't know anything about the sport to I, it just all the action looks like people are walking or it's terrible or everything catches fire. Or there's a lot of random th- pressing the throttle because they want to pass at that exact moment. And they just couldn't, they didn't have it in them before then. So let's get started. So I'm going to do what I normally do, which is give you a great big long summary of the thing. Now, Stallone, when he made this thing, he said he wanted to make it because driving a race car is terrifying. It was shot over eight months in nine races at five countries, has a Rotten Tomato score of just 14%. One of the one, one of the reviews cited underdeveloped characters, silly plot dynamics, and obvious CG effects. One guy on IMDb, I went looking through the IMDb reviews for it, the Internet Movie Database reviews for it a couple of weeks ago, and one dude on IMDb, they got he and his friends got so bored in the theater that they actually started. I'm going to read you his line, his quote here. We actually started counting sets of euphemism for a woman's chest. The unofficial count was 41. The rule was that to be counted, the female could not be in a starring role, but had to be photographed just to show off her chest, just to get the movie to the next scene. The film makes Days of Thunder appear to be fine art. Now, naturally, the great part about this is the next guy down the list on IMDb was like, you know, it's an above average racing movie. I actually kind of liked it, which tells you a lot. So the plot seems too complex to explain at times. Other times it just seems too stupid to explain. But here we go. So there's a driver, Jimmy. It's IndyCar in the 1990s. It's Champ Car. Jimmy is good. He's maybe too good. He's too uncontrolled. He's challenging the known good champ, a guy named Bo Brandenburg. He's German, you can tell, because his last name is the name of an 18th century neoclassical monument in Berlin. And yet, you know, Jimmy loses his cool. So his team boss, Burt Reynolds, he's doing his porn director character from Boogie Nights, but he's in a wheelchair like Frank Williams for some reason. His team boss brings in his old friend, Joe, that's played by Stallone. Joe is old. He's washed up, but not really. Maybe we're not sure. He never seems to be very invested in any of this. And Joe's job, Joe Joe's job is to help Jimmy not suck, which is fun because they never really, for the first half of the movie, they don't talk or test or anything. They just seem to orbit each other and glare at each other and go to racetracks that the movie says or places they really aren't. Like Cleveland, it's supposed to be Toronto or Toronto's supposed to be Cleveland or sometimes they're in Japan and it looks like Chicago. I, I don't know. But the thing is, Joe, Joe wants to race. And in the middle of all this, we have girlfriends. There's the German guy's girlfriend. Her name is Estella. She is a blonde. She has very prominent lips. She makes a face that says she's very concerned about things, but also in a kind of sexful way. And she makes this face all the time. She wants to leave Bo because he's too into driving. She starts dating Jimmy. Jimmy's brother, who is also his manager, is this dude named Robert Sean Leonard. He was in Dead Poet Society, and he's doing his very best impersonation of a man who was very annoying and awful and on a lot of coke, especially when he bought his suits, which are very loose. Now, I, I can't remember the actor's, I remember the actor's name, but not the character's name. This 
dead poets guy, but he tells Jimmy not to date Estella. Now, naturally, Jimmy's like, I'm going to date Estella. Joe goes and talks to the German driver. The German driver apologizes to concerned blonde lip sex lady, and she goes back with him, and all of a sudden, Jimmy isn't dating him, and that character arc comes to a screeching halt, we never hear about it again. Meanwhile, in the background, believe it or not, there's kind of sort of some racing. None of it is believable. There's a lot of wheel turning. There's a lot of uh, grimacing. There's a lot of like, I'm going to slowly press the throttle down and pass, but also tire screech. There's a lot of tire noise in this movie, sometimes even in the rain. A reporter shows up. She's doing an expose on male dominance in sports. She's played by Gina Gershon. Stallone dates her. Then we don't really hear from her again. Stallone's ex-wife comes into the picture. She's with the driver that Stallone replaced on the team. That's kind of a thing, except it's not really. There's a moment where people are very, very angry about sexy lip lady at a party in Chicago. And then Stallone and Jimmy, the young dude, they, they steal some race cars and somehow they're on, in street clothes and they start them and they leave and they're driving through the loop in Chicago. Chicago downtown without helmets. There, there wasn't even a crew to start the car, but they're, they're, the manhole gets sucked out of the pavement and bus stop glass gets shattered. <laughs> Stallone jumps in the car. He's like, he's literally, Jimmy gets in the car and leaves and Stallone stands there. He's like, hey, out of the way, move the crowd. I also, I have to drive a race car in Chicago. And then they're th driving through the streets. They're going under semi trucks. And I, at this point, I'm just going to read you what Roger Ebert, the old movie revered, at the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, because he did a great job of explaining it, and I, he, I'm no Roger Ebert. Quote, one of the action sequences is noteworthy. The phenom, mad at the girl, steals a race car from an auto show in Chicago and hits 195 miles, miles an hour through the loop with Stallone chasing him in another race car. Although the chase is tracked by helicopters, so inefficient are the Chicago police that after the kid pulls over, Stallone has time to give him the first trophy he ever won and deliver a lecture about faith and will. And even in the end, still, we don't hear any sirens in the background from the Chicago police, perhaps because, as students of geography will observe, the two characters are suddenly now in Toronto. There are sparks. There are loud noises. The whole sequence is basically the whole movie in a nutshell. Stallone and Jimmy, they talk about racing. They become friends again. They point at laptop screens and do training things. The cars look extremely derpy. One minute you're looking at a champ car in the pits. The next minute it's like, I don't know, an Indy Lights car that somebody hit with a hammer that has a big forehead bulge in it. None of the bodywork fits right. We get to a couple of races at the end of the season. There's a lot of yelling. Everything seems to be coming to a head. People's careers are threatened by Burt Reynolds, who, by the way, is in the movie mostly just to be angry and uninvested in everything and to play kind of sort of the same character he played in Boogie Nights, which he had just come off filming, by the way, which is, I don't know, who did he play in Boogie Nights? In Boogie Nights, he basically just played a guy who liked naked people and was angry about things. But that's this movie, too. Whole passing moves and races are planned days in advance and discussed over dinner, and it's amusing. And then you look and you think, okay, great, we're wrapping things up. It's the end of the movie. Things are getting close. And then you look at the screen, you realize there's still an hour to go because this movie is two hours long. The guy who was kicked out that he replaced is now back in the car, except then there's a crash. He crashes into Germany. This is a crash that Sorry, he doesn't crash into Germany. He crashes into Jimmy in Germany. This is a crash that takes like two whole minutes of screen time to play out. His car's airborne for like two or three weeks. Cars pass underneath him. The camera sits in his cockpit watching those cars for like a month. And then the dude who crashed, the other guy, the dude he replaced to replace replacement, is flying like a half a mile into the woods and he nearly dies in a lake upside down. But we don't care because we barely met this guy. And all we know is that he's really cheery and kind of reminds you of like, I don't know, Montoya with a bunch of caffeine in him. And he's of Latin descent and he married Stallone's ex-wife and... At this point, Jimmy's still in the race. Somebody gets on the radio and tells him that this dude has crashed. He turns around. They say, you have to go back and help him. He turns around. He drives backward through active race traffic because, of course, that's what you do. Guy's in a lake. He drives off the dirt. Of course, that's what you do. Guy's in a lake. He's in a literal field full of mud in an Indy car and swimming through a river to find the driver and save him. In the paddock on the radio, sexy lips lady tells the German driver to stop and get out of the car and also help. German driver's like, yes. Guy is in the lake. I must go. Car goes into the river. At turn five. She says, oh, no. She says, you have to help. She says, and the German turns around and goes swimming. And they say, Latin gentleman. And even though he's been upside down on fire for like five minutes in the water, he's somehow miraculously not dead. And the German and Jimmy, the young dude, they flip the car over, even though it's full of water, even though it's on fire. Nobody gets burned. The guy's alive. 
naturally there's hospital bed sequence. Mm, everybody's like, oh, I had to do it. You know, take chances. That is life. There's a final race. It's shot on Belle Isle in Detroit. The German is now managed by Jimmy's brother. Ooh, the intrigue is real and there's backstabbing. It's like soap operas. There are shots of drivers doing serious things. Real drivers like Montoya at one point. We see he's tying his shoes next to his transporting. He has this kind of like sad Keanu Reeves face on. He's pondering the universe with emotion on his face, which if it's really funny because if you've ever spent any time paying attention to Montoya, you know that he's just a neon person. He doesn't do that. During the race, a CGI wheel comes off a car and goes into the air. It briefly passes by the moon. It falls back into orbit. It falls in the stands. Doesn't hit anybody. Just goes right between two people, knocks a hole in the bench, and then everybody's fine. And they're like, oh, cool. We're not going to address that again. There's an EDM tune played over the scenes where drivers are doing pre-race rituals. The chorus is a woman going, do you love your mother like I love mine? Do you love your mother like I love mine? So many music cues in this movie. The music never stops. Joe is back in the car. Stallone, he's back in the car. They talk, they trade. He's Jimmy's teammates. There's a lot of crashing. Joe tells him while they're driving on the radio, show him what you're made of, kid. And Jimmy goes, okay, Joe. We see Chip Ganassi in the pits being very happy. Jimmy loses the nerve, loses the lead. Three laps to go. Joe takes the lead. Stallone, he's in the lead. He jumps his car, four wheels up, over a curb, breaks his suspension. Front wheel is cocked at like 45 degrees to straight. There's smoke pouring off of it. He's still leading. He's lifting off, someone says on the radio. I see that, someone else says, disappointed. He had it because dialogue is very important in this movie. It tells you everything. Also, it tells you nothing. Jimmy figures out how things work in the last lap. He wins at a photo finish, wins the championship, and that's the movie. The whole thing is really just a giant acid trip while watching bad footies of 90s Indy cars, but also things that are not Indy cars. And you get to see Montoya tie his shoes. Jeff, Ross. How did you feel at the end of this thing? That, <clears throat> that was w- like orders of magnitude more entertaining than the actual movie. <laughs> yeah. I won't take that as a compliment because no. you can't be more entertaining than nothing, but thank you. <laughs> so, so I made you guys watch this thing again, and it was great because the first thing that Jeff came back with was they're all wearing their headsets wrong. This is really annoying. They're wearing their headsets wrong. <laughs> right. Unless Sylvester Stallone has his ears on his cheeks. He's not hearing anything through those, that headset. <laughs> Ross? So, so when, it, when this movie came out, like Jeff, I was kind of like, wow, this is cool. Like, this is, this is good for racing. And I can remember being on an airplane and uh, not, want, not willing to pay the, you know, $1.99 or $7 or whatever it was to, to rent a movie on a plane. So I'm sitting there and I kept looking up at the screen of somebody sitting a few seats in front of me. And because this movie is playing and I kept looking up there going, huh, wow, that's bad. Well, that doesn't look good. Well, that's looking pretty good. So based off of what I saw from things popping up on a screen on an airplane, I decided that I would never watch that movie until Sam comes I, along and says, you guys need to watch this. I bring pain into people's lives. What can yeah. I say? Yeah. The, uh, the other thing that you said, which proves that the movie is unrealistic, is you said, cut to a shot of Chip Ganassi smiling. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right there. <clears throat> it's not, it can't be real. So we, we need to talk a bit about, about the realism versus, versus the lack of realism in a racing movie. But there are, what I find really interesting about the thing is that there are moments where they don't just say, okay, because every movie about anything takes creative liberties takes factual liberties but there are moments where they don't just say all right well we can't show how this past would have happened we can't show what's actually happening here we can't show the technical details of yada yada people would be bored and they double down there's a scene early on when stallone gets in the car and he's going on and testing they're on a street circuit with no one else there which is magnificent to begin with but they're on a street circuit with no one else there stallone goes out and tests and the people in the pits are talking and he stops And he throws out a quarter in three separate corners and somebody asks him what they're going to do, what he's going to do. And somebody else explains, well, you know, he's very, very good. So he can just hold a controlled drift and in a full 10 tenths lap and go out and pick up these quarters with the tires without actually crashing and, or, you know, anybody can do it with the front tires, but he's going to do it with the rears. The rears are sticky enough and the quarters will be back in the tires when you see gets in and that happens and it's supposed to be impressive and it just ends up it's early in the movie it's like i don't know 15 minutes in and it it's one of those things where you just get this 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 link to the whole rest of the of the the narrative you're like oh it's going to be like this it's this kind of party why what else hits you watching it that first time what else hits you that just 
was so off and so wrong. Like, how did that strike you? I don't want to. Uh, so, so the very first thing that got me is, is the crash scenes, <laughs> the cars that were like, you know, 85 feet in the air, tumbling and t- flipping and on fire. And everyone just carries on like, like the race <laughs> carries on. Going, okay. So that, uh, that part just kind of, yeah. But I, I, I guess I, I do want to, I want to, I want to step up and say, you know, there was something accurate in this movie. And I'm not sure if either one of you got this. Hmm? I didn't know, but my wife pointed it out as we were watching this thing, the blonde with the big lips, there's a scene where she's in a swimming pool and she's doing all this cool stuff. Do you know that she is, she's Canadian and she was on the Canadian national synchronized swimming team. And she was actually doing what she did. And that was real. That was like that. So that pretty much wraps up the movie right there. And that, that is the most realistic thing in the entire movie because it is real. Everything else is far from it. Someplace there's a podcast about synchronized swimming right now. <clears throat> really? And they're reviewing this movie going, that was a really good scene. And there were some other cars going around and stuff, but that, I don't know about that, but that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like what it's, I watch. It's not the synchronized swimming is the name of the, the podcast. <laughs> right, that's the podcast. Right. <laughs> it's like when I watch, you know, Grand Prix, the, the 60s Frankenheimer film, and you're like, that, that guy in the background, that dude with the mustache, that's Graham Hill. He's just sitting there. I know that. That's a thing I know. They don't make a deal out of that. I know that. So. Yeah. So Stallone's motivations on this thing, there's, there's so much predictably, cause it's one of, it, 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 it was nominated for or won a bunch of raspberry awards. It's, it's one of the worst acknowledged as one of the lo- worst films of the nineties, but there's so much background on it. And he's given a bunch of interviews and he gave a bunch of interviews at the time and since, but what I found really compelling about it was that the reasons he wanted to make the thing to begin with were honorable and noble. So he goes over there, he gets into racing. He's really, really drawn to the risk and the cost and why people spend so much time putting so much on the line. Here's a quote that said, people kept telling me how expensive racing was, how one car can go through two or three million a year. And I wanted to know, how does the driver handle the pressure? How does he control the machine? Human aspect interested. The speed was just a byproduct. And that's, that's why we care about this stuff at all. Like, What's remarkable is none of that comes through in the film. Like, did you see any scrapes of that? Is there an ounce of that? What people go through? Do you think it's there for normal people? I, I, well, I don't know. We're we're not normal people. So first (laughs) off, I have to admit that. Uh, I remember when the talk about this and, you know, Stallone originally apparently wanted to make the movie around F1, Mm -hmm. but as you said, Ecclestone wouldn't allow him the insight or whatever, get inside enough. So he decided he was going to do it about IndyCar. And I I can remember IndyCar embracing this, going, this is going to be great for us. And, you know, kind of think about it almost as it was sort of like the drive to survive of the day. Like it was going to be great for the sport. And the the drivers that are sort of, uh, you know, their background, they show up in the Montoya tying his shoes and Max Pappas smiling and, you know, all of this kind of stuff in the movie. I, I, I think all of the drivers that did that, they thought this was going to be a good movie. This was going to be really good. This is going to be good for the sport. I want to help support this thing. And I can remember all the support IndyCar and the community was giving this movie. And, you know, I, 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 I can't help but just wonder, you know, what the, the premiere night was like. When everybody in IndyCar and the drivers went, we're going to go and watch this and how they felt sitting there because Uh, uh, Stallone missed it. And that's the, that's the sad thing. I think from they had a budget 76 million or whatever you said, Sam, I mean that in back then that's, you know, that's a hundred million dollar movie today. At least those are big tent pole kind of movies. And man, you, they, so they had a good budget. They could have, uh, I guess that's a frustrating thing from a racer is they could have made a really good movie. And <clears throat> I think the plot, you know, if that's the plot, I'm not a writer and a story inventor, if 
but maybe the story was okay. I don't know. But the, <laughs> it was so distracting around it that it distracted from the story. They could have made it, and you don't have to get it exactly. You know, if it's a, if it's an, if they're racing in 1996 and it's a 1994 Lola against the 96 Reynard, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Who cares? Right. But it was so far off just so far off that even I think the casual person who watches like the Indy 500 and that's their racing thing for the year would see the fakeness of it. And that's, it's, it's disappointing that they had a great opportunity and kind of blew it, I think. And, and Sam, you brought up the, uh, Stallone wanted to kind of get inside of people. And I think to me, ultimately that was probably what was most disappointing. Because they were like, every now and then there'd be some, some dialogue and you're going, oh, they're actually going to get into something. Nope. I missed that too. Uh, like it, it just, I was trying to read into what they were trying to say and I couldn't quite do it. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so back up a little. So what's the, you, you touch on this, Ross, you touch on this, Jeff, but at the beginning of the movie, there's a, a, a title card. It says, it says the sport, it says champ car has something like 900 million spectators globally, which is comical, right? Like I looked it up at the time, carts national televised audience for one race might've been 20 million people at the peak, right? And yeah, they had races around the world. They went to Brazil, they went to Tokyo, they went to Japan, but it, so much of what was cool about that period in motorsport and about that series in general, in, in particular was blown out of, out of proportion. And so much, or sorry, wasn't touched on. And so much of what wasn't worth touching on was blown out of proportion, but both of you were heavily involved in motorsport in the nineties and, and especially in IndyCar, you know, that I was, I was in high school, graduated in 99. Oh, sure. There he goes with the age thing again. I know I'm, I'm 43. I'm basically a baby, but that was, that wasn't actually, there was a lot to tap. There It was a really special time, you know, cart in the 1990s in particular, the cars were making four figure horsepower. They were massively fast. They were heavy. They were hard to drive turbocharged. It was a dominant, well-attended sport that mattered globally. What, what was it like at the time having that? In, in having it in the background, stands were full. People showed up. You know, advertising f didn't fall off trees, but close to it. How did it feel at the time? It was cool, and it was, you know, we we had cars that those cars that they showed, not the Indy Lights cars that were <laughs> that they showed, <clears throat> but the actual cars. Some some of them were there. They didn't have sequential shift and paddle shift at the same time, even though the movie showed that. That was not <laughs> that was not a thing. You didn't have to use the clutch. There was lots of clutching going on in that movie, which, well, but those are small things. Okay. You know, it's, I guess that was to show, like you said, you push the throttle harder. Like you only go half throttle normally, but when you need to pass somebody, then you go to full throttle. That I get that. But those times were, I mean, that was, I don't know, you know, everybody uses the term the golden era or whatever, but I mean, that's when those cars were low sounded great and they, they're kind of back to that now but but there was a lull in there where they were stock block engines blowing up in the early irl days and this was before that when it was like Phew. man these cars were fast they were going whatever 240 at michigan and i mean that was ross you drove the things you talk about it yeah I, I, and i guess this is where and i understand this movie was probably not made for the three of us. Well, maybe for Sam, because mm, maybe not. He's so but... young. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm but... sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't hear you, Ross. Your your voice is too old for me to understand. You're speaking yeah, in dialect yeah. not used. So yeah. Go on, yeah. please. Yes. You know, I I understand the movie was not made for us, but I I have to believe that there are people that were watching it going, uh, this just seems a little. It, it was sort of like a sci-fi comedy if that makes any sense like it was yeah. so far out there and to your point jeff is the series and Sam, you, like the series was so strong then it was so good that you know if you'd shot almost a documentary i think it would have i think it would have made more money <laughs> because you didn't need to glamorize what was happening like to that level 
uh, yeah, add a little plot, add, you know, add, add more women and whatever, you know, like to, to make it that way. But, uh, like every racing movie has done to some extent. Um, and that's okay, but you didn't have to go as far as you did with so many things that were just like, if they had, if they'd hired Jeff to be the, uh, what, what, what do you call that person? The technical advisor consultant or whatever consultant. Yeah. yeah. yeah to go, no, <clears throat> that doesn't look right. You know, like if they just done that, how much would that have cost Jeff out of that $70 million budget, you would have taken it. You would have done it for 7 million. I bet. Oh, would have probably done it for 1 million. <laughs> Right. Call up Stallone. Look, look at that. The, this, here's the thing. Okay. It wasn't made for us, for hardcore racer people. Right. I get that. Uh, I I don't think Top Gun was made for pilots at Miramar to watch at night. I, I get that too. But even if you were just a movie goer, the CGI of the crashes and the tire, like you said, Sam, the tire falling down and hitting the grandstands and stuff from the tires, from the suspension uprights viewpoint and you're going down. I mean, the CGI was so bad that a casual movie goer would go, that's, and it wasn't trying to be, you know, whatever, Jurassic Park or something where you knew it wasn't real. This was trying to be real and they were so bad at that, that again, it's, ah, oh, it's just for $76 million, I wish they would have done something good for the sport. Yeah. It, I think it's important too to pull down, and and again, we don't want to sit here and, and bash the thing and dismantle it. But what's it's important to pull down why why it didn't work and why it didn't work from a standpoint of what what we'd want in a film like this if it did work. And ultimately, you know, you guys use the phrase it wasn't wasn't built for us, right? But ultimately, there are films that do work for an enthusiast audience. And it does, I don't mean necessarily in racing, but for any enthusiast audience, any audience that knows something about the subject matter that also work on a, a mass level. Like I know, I know pilots and I've, I've, I've talked to a couple of military pilots who saw the last Top Gun flick and they're like, oh yeah, it's a giant cartoon. Like it doesn't matter. Who cares? It was a great movie. There, there were things in there that were compelling that kept you watching that, that made you care about how things work. Like if you go back and you go all the way back to the 1960s to, like I mentioned Frankenheimer's Grand Prix, right? That is a 1960s melodrama with packaged around an F1 series, an F1 season and a bunch of invented details. And it, it's not a great film, but it works as a 60s melodrama. And, and you say, okay, well, fine, that's not, that's not a big deal. But there's a lot of stuff that doesn't with those same ingredients. What, what is it about, if you're going to set back, you look at CART from the 1990s, you look at motorsport now, what is it about the, the human drama there? that never seems enough because all three of us, we've all spent a lot of, you guys have spent a great more, deal more time in motorsport than I have, but we've all spent a lot of time in racing and everything about how motorsport works is compelling. Why people do it, what happens in the car, what happens in, in everybody's head. Why, what do you think it is about those ingredients that causes somebody to go, no, that needs to go to 11 and, and no, I'm sorry, Hollywood's 11. That needs to go to 15 instead of just cranking back down the lens into something a little more human. Why do you think people need to blow it out of proportion? So I think the first thing that comes to mind, Sam, is, is I've had a lot of people, you know, say I've, I've talked to drivers and you know, you, I'm sure you've interviewed drivers, right? And there's a lot of times when drivers go, I don't know. I don't know why I do this. It just, I need to do this. Yeah. And so I, you know, in some ways you can kind of go, okay, well, Stallone took on something that's really, really difficult to do, to draw out what it is that drives us to drive and do what we do. And I, I yeah, I'm not saying it's impossible because I think, you know, there have been some movies that have, have given us a good glimpse of that. You know, you mentioned Grand Prix many times and, you know, one of the best ever, I think. And, but you know, Ford versus Ferrari wasn't super realistic, but it gave us a glimpse rush, you know, kind of thing. And I don't want to start naming off all these other movies. I think the animated cars movie does a really, really good job of getting inside of how we think better than most. So, uh, I, I think there's, 
I think Stallone took on something and he just missed it and just was not able to pull out what it is that he was trying to do. Because I, I, everything that I've heard about this movie was that was his intent was to bring out what it was, why it is that we do what we do. And I, 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 I kept listening, watching the movie going, Oh, somewhere in here, they're going to have that great line and you're going to go, that's it. But it just <laughs> missed it. And, and wouldn't. Okay. And, and maybe this is the, the problem because we're too into racing or that's what we do. But Rocky Sylvester Stallone movie, right? I'm sure the uh, uh, professional boxers are like, Oh my God, that was so fake and all of that kind of stuff. But it seemed to have some of that good emotional, you understand why he was trying to win or why he was training so hard and the ups and downs of that. To me, that never came across in, in Driven, you know, none of that ever came across, you know, they could have done, <clears throat> they could have done a whole thing about qualifying for the Indy 500 and just taking the month of May and the trials and tribulations of what it's like. And we had a podcast about that and we could have just done, uh, Sylvester Stallone could have played Ross. It would have been a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, I wanted to, I want to do a Stallone, Stallone accent now. That's something like the timing of Royal release of the breaks. I can't, I can't do Stallone. <laughs> but so, so that's a good point, right? So Stallone wrote at, I don't remember if he directed Rocky, but he definitely wrote it. And Rocky is a great film, but it's not, it's not exactly Citizen Kane, right? It's not classic cinema, but there is, there is an element. There's, there, there's an element of, of something kind of in, I, I, a non-tangible piece in there that draws you to it. Right. And, and somebody in period, there was an LA times reporter that talked to Stallone that said something like, you know, you have a long history of making films about sports that no one cares about boxing, uh, hockey, arm wrestling. And at the time, I'm sure, I don't know if hockey, nobody cared about hockey in the nineties. I think people did, but the, 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 the writer was basically making the point, like, why do you go into these worlds that really take a lot of context to explain? And Stallone basically told him that, you know, it, it's, that's, that's what draws him to this stuff. And he driven, oddly enough, he gave an interview later where he said that the thing was supposed to be, it had autobiographical elements was, you know, he tied it into his life. He wrote something like 20 drafts and the first 15 were about like man's journey to become a better man, falling from great heights in a career, becoming a drunkard, losing your wife, like getting up to the top of a business and then coming apart. And if you look at it through that lens, the terrible character that he played in that movie. And by the way, like when he's actually, he's probably the best, it's the best performance in the whole film. And when Stallone is giving the best performance in your movie, you know, you got a problem, but the, the terrible performance that he did in there, if you look at it through that lens, there's bits and pieces of that. And he, every interview I read with him talking about this, this movie in particular, all of them zeroed in on the idea of the movie that I wish he had made, or at least, you know, you read the interviews, you're like, that is, that's really interesting. I want to go see this guy drive around, you know, drive around in circles and, and not a champ car who cares but it's not and it 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 gets to the core of i think why why we do anything and why we care about it you know the the movie it's got the same bits and pieces as rocky there's there's an arc there's a third act complication there's you know person who tries to find himself fails and then comes back toward the end and everybody's happy but it wasn't without without doing something really really hard there's a there's a, a theme in screenwriting. Um, Dan Harmon, the guy behind Community and a bunch of other things, Rick and Morty, famously said that, you know, every story can ultimately be pulled down to, and Travis, Travis Braun, Jeff's screenwriter son, is going to hear this and know that I'm getting it wrong, so forgive me. But he said that every story is basically somebody wants something, they have to sacrifice to get it, they get it, but they're changed in the end, right? That's, that's every classic story throughout history. I don't know how true that is, but it applies to this. It applies to Rocky. If, if you're gonna, if you're gonna tell somebody to go watch a racing movie that works or build a racing, movie, what do you, what do you look for? Is it they're, they're interested in motorsport or they're interested in why we do what we do. And I think ultimately a lot of these movies get made because people just want to see cars crash. Right. I, to me that, uh, and we're, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I would look at, uh, what I would want in a racing movie is going to be entirely different. But what I thought was interesting, talk to a lot of people who watched the, uh, that 
um, I don't remember what it might have just been called Senna, but it was the, the documentary on him. And and I don't want to stereotype here, but there's probably more men who are interested in racing than women. But women who I talked to who didn't have really much to do with racing loved that movie. They were like, wow, that was a really good movie. And that was a pretty hardcore racing movie, I thought. But but yet somehow they got the normal non-hardcore racing person to really like it. And I think Drive to Survive does that in a similar way. So I, I agree, Jeff, that that it's uh it's it's giving the insight into like the Senna documentary. It, you realize what who this person was and what drove him and what made him who he was. And yep. You know, I, I, I think other racing movies have done that as well to some extent. Uh, I think we were talking weeks ago when we were talking about this, doing this episode, and I'd mentioned there was this one that Dustin Hoffman did. Uh, I think it was Dustin Hoffman or was it El Pacino? I can't remember. One of those two guys called Bobby Deerfield. Yeah. yeah. And it's got like, it has little racing in it, but I, I, th- think that I took away more sort of insights into why, why do drivers do what they do? Like there was more of that in there. And I think that's what, that's what uh, a good racing movie provides. And I think, you know, probably what any good movie does, boxing movie or, uh, you know, Top Gun movie or anything like that. It gives you the insight into who they are as humans and why they do what they do and kind of gives you that, uh, understanding of what they do. I, I, I'm just going to jump in here. I just thought of something. You're, you, I'm agreeing with you 100%. And I'm trying to think of shows or movies that do that. You know, um, if you're an NFL fan, hard knocks, you get to go in the training camp, see what the coaches are doing, see what the players are doing, see them struggle to try to make the roster and things like that. Drive to survive, the inside. What's the, how does it really work? And I think people, who enjoy a sport or even on the periphery think it's kind of interesting, would love to know how it really works. You know, that's what drive to survive provides. That's what hard knocks provides. That's what any of these drive to survive knockoffs, like there's whatever full swing for the golf tour, you know, you get to see what these guys really do. And I don't think driven showed us that. And and it wasn't meant to be a documentary. Like, oh, I think it was entirely a Gina Gershon. To- <laughs> yes. Everything is real. Go on. <laughs> but, but it, it, so I'm not expecting a documentary, True. but I'm expecting some insight into that kind of thing. And, it, it, you know, I, I got more of that from Top Gun, you know, that kind of a insight right. into what that world is like. And yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, again, uh, we know our sport, so we're looking for that. Um, but I'm not sure. I think, unfortunately, I think this one just missed that whole insight piece. When you, <laughs> when you, when you, you meet people who find out that you're in motorsport, you know, we've talked before about the plane conversation, right? You sit down on a plane and somebody finds out, somebody le- leans over and goes, so what do you do? And I know a lot of people in the business who are like, well, I sell ice cream or, um, yeah, mm, yeah I paper, I make paper. I, I live in Pennsylvania mainly just to get out of the conversation because when you, not because you don't want to share or talk because ultimately everybody on some level has this idea of what that career is. Like, I think I know what it's like to be a fighter pilot. I have no clue what it's like to be a fighter pilot, but in my head, there's a picture of it. What do people, what do people think you, you guys do and how your job works when they ask, when you, you meet folks on airplanes or in cocktail parties? I'm going to hmm. say, unfortunately, that- <laughs> Things like driven have <laughs> skewed that picture. Okay. Uh, but what, how does, what does it look like? Was it, what do they want to know about? I actually had that happen to me at, um, I was sitting there going to Le Mans and I was reading, uh, back when they had actual magazines with real paper and stuff back in the hundred years ago. I was Before reading Sam was sport. born. I'm very young. Sam was not born. It's true. Yeah. I look Maybe very good for my age. Anyway, I had this magazine. I'm sitting there. We're getting going. We're going to Paris, and the guy sitting next to me goes, "Oh, yeah, you into racing?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "What? Uh, 
and I said, yeah, I'm on my way to Le Mans. And he quickly, you know, I'm a race engineer, da, da, da. And he goes, oh, wow, that's so cool. And, and he, and he said, we always watch the race cars testing at, uh, in Las Vegas. And I said, oh, you come out to the track? He goes, no, no, no. He said, we fly over. I work at Nellis Air Force Base and we fly over and we look down and see the cars testing at Las Vegas. I said, oh, you fly. I, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I'm the chief uh, F-16, I guess, Air Force, F-16 um, instructor at Nellis. I'm like, wow. He goes, yeah, we fly over and we're like looking at the race cars and we talking to each other when we're in formation, like, wow, that looks like the most awesome job ever. And he was like going on and on about how cool racing was. And I said, well, hmm, funny you should say that, but we are standing down there working on our cars and you guys go whipping over it, however many mock whatever. And we look up and go, wow, that looks like the coolest job ever. We'd really like to have that job. <laughs> and he goes, he says, okay, yeah. So, so tell me, tell me, tell me. He goes like, and the, the movie had, had, just come out days of thunder and he goes so tell me like days of thunder is that like is that kind of like how it really is in in your business and i thought oh, how am i going to explain this <laughs> to this guy <laughs> you know i don't want to knock it down completely and i'm like well and then it dawned on me i said so tell me like top gun is that like it really is in your business and he goes all right i get it <laughs> But, but that's, that's the thing, right? And, and there, th somewhere in between those two extremes is the, the element of entertainment, the element of story, the element of humanity that makes, those, that makes Top Gun relatable, even if I mean, Top Gun's enjoyable and Driven is, Driven is not. Driven is deeply unenjoyable, but that's, that's part of it, right? Ross? Yeah, Sam, the kind of going to your question is, you know, I've been on that plane and I've had somebody ask me and I've made the mistake or whatever, you know, I, I, I didn't get out the, you know, I'm a, I'm a consultant role, uh, answer quick enough. And right. I say something about a race driver and I was like, Oh, you know, my cousin has a 69 Camaro. Uh, so, you know, then the conversation goes there. And what you find out is that many people, not all, but, uh, many people go, Oh, well, you must have really good reaction time. Mm. You must be really brave. You must have a bit of a death wish. You know, you like taking big risks and those are all things that are almost farthest from the truth, right? Yeah. Because you know, the best race drivers, they manage risk. They don't want to die. They, they want to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. So I think that part of it, and, and I don't know if Stallone didn't do his homework enough and kind of just got that surface level of what well, race drivers are brave. They have a death wish, you know, they'll take big chances and really what they really care about is winning, staying in the podium and then having the girl and taking the girl home at the end of the day. Um, they get that kind of surface level perspective of the sport. And, uh, it just seems like if you just dug a little deeper, you'd start to find out there are a lot of race drivers who are, they're insecure to the point where I got to prove myself. You know, there's that part of it. There's the just curiosity that's inside of, of drivers. And by the way, if they relied on reaction time, they'd all be dead. <laughs> you know, they've got to, they've got to know how to, how to, how to, uh, uh, anticipate things. So it wouldn't have taken too much more to dig that little bit deeper and then tell that story. And I think it would have been just as interesting. And in my opinion, more, more interesting. That, that's and how does a movie like that, Sam, you, you, you probably know this, but how does, how do you spend, how do you have a $76 million budget and let it get off the rails that far? Somebody must've been standing there going, yeah, no, this is, I mean, watch the dailies, right? <laughs> and just go, whoa, no. Yeah. This somebody in that whole thing had to see that and just. And you didn't have to be a racing expert because the CGI was so terrible. You didn't have to, I mean, it was just, it was, it was bad on so many different levels. I, what amazes me is that somebody could spend that much money and get it so wrong without noticing it early on. I don't understand 
how that could happen. I, I don't know. I don't know diddly squat about making movies. I've read a lot about script writing and read, read a lot of books from people who are in that world. Uh, specifically, there's a guy named William Goldman who talks about it a lot, who um, was tied to the Princess Bride and a bunch of other things. But so much of that that system, there, there's an interesting quote from, or an old line from somebody years and years ago that goes something like, when you find out just how complex the average film is, how much work it takes to get made, how much time, how many people, how much money, how many creative voices there are that may or may not be creative they're invested in all of that it becomes very apparent that the miracle isn't that there are bad movies and good movies the miracle is that there are movies that get made at all and that some of them are good that they should all be atrocious you know any project that has mil- tens of millions of dollars on the line at a minimum you know hundreds of thousands of dollars if it's an indie thing but any project that has so that many creative voices and that many people on the line and that much at stake and the fact that it all comes apart, you know, it's like, it's like endurance racing, right? You know, in, in the end, it's not that it's not a miracle that you win Le Mans. It's a miracle that you finish the thing. It's a miracle that, you know, the whole thing doesn't go up in flames the moment you start. It's a miracle that so much happens. And, and I think so much of, so much of the movies that so many of the movies that get made about the subject are either really effective documentaries. You mentioned Senna, right? You know, Senna works because there's a line of dialogue in that movie that isn't spoken in period footage. It was deeply, deeply about the person at the center and why he did what he did. And it was long, but it wasn't sugarcoated. And there was, did you guys see, uh, I think 20, yeah, almost 20 years ago, there was a MotoGP documentary that was narrated by Ewan McGregor called Faster that focused on, I think it was the hmm, yeah. 01 or 02 season had Max Biaggi and uh, Valentino Rossi in it. <clears throat> and it was like, <clears throat> when that thing came out, my girlfriend at the time watched it with me and I later made my mom watch it and both of them loved it. And th- there's something in there. It's just, it's a racing documentary. Like there it tracks the whole time. And there's something compelling about it because they end up focusing on the details aren't, the presence or absence of the details isn't what kills it. It's whether they focus on why people do what they do. Ross, you, you were going to say something? Uh, I, as you were talking, I'm kind of going back to something you said very early on about the music. And I'm like, did you guys find the music distracting <laughs> yes. and annoying throughout yeah. the thing? Oh, yeah. It was, oh, yeah. I looked this up. I found it so annoying that I looked it up. And this, this is where, like, you start pulling apart films. You get into the, the structure of how a film is assembled. You realize how much can be made or lost in the editing room. So if you pay attention, every time somebody speaks, there's a cut. The camera cuts. There's also, it, most of the shots are handheld. The camera never, never settles down. And every single scene has music behind it. Sometimes it's like a Shania Twain type warbling out some country like, how will I live? Because somebody's having an emotion. And sometimes it's a bunch of EDM in a club and you're made to feel very, very angry about things because your teenage feelings are happening right now with guitars. And whatever it is, all they do, there's no subtlety. It's thrown in your face. And saying that a, like a big budget Hollywood film has no subtlety is comical, right? But that ties into the whole, what you talked about earlier, Ross, the, the fact that car culture and racing culture are seen as a monoculture. They're, you know, we are all adrenaline junkies. We are all in it because we like being afraid and skirting death and doing 190 miles an hour on motorcycles and traffic. That's what, that's not it. You know, that's, uh, I think back to a movie that I really loved and I know we're not rating movies here, but it's the, it's the opposite end of the spectrum. I think here is Lama. Yeah. It was a great movie. I thought, (laughs) which has no plot. Right? Which was no but plot and probably. But you understand terrible. why? <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, to me, that was like, yep, been there, done that. Yep, yep, yeah. Oh man, the old, oh, the old Lama garages, the wooden ones. Oh, those are terrible. You know, you. I, but that's for me. But I don't think it was a. It was a very successful movie. No, you know, nobody watched it. No, it, and it, it, it by the standards I did of many times. <laughs> Me too. I thought it was awesome. I used to, which I, is a thing I, I tell Travis. I say, "Hey, if I watch, if you send me a, a script that you're writing, and I read it and go, yeah, I don't think I'd ever watch this, Trav. That's the one you should make <laughs> <laughs> because it'll be a hit. 
<laughs> it's like the Beatles in the 60s. If it, Was it Capitol? No, it was the other record label. If somebody says, you're never going to make it, that whatever that guy said, that guy said, you're never going to make it, it's stupid, we don't want you, and then they become the Beatles. Like right. We need to just run literally everything we do by Jeff. If Jeff hates it, it's great. Right. It'll be a, <laughs> it'll be a giant hit. Right. But, okay, so... We're basically out of time, but before we cap this, I, I thought it would be funny. And, and by funny, I mean, it would be very much amusing to me and probably to no one else. And it may in fact tank the show. This may be where everything goes under. We stop doing this. All of you stop listening, but I think it would very much amuse me if, uh, I had Ross and Jeff read a couple of lines out of context for the movie. And the reason this will amuse me is because I am a child and that's all there is to it. So I sprung this on these guys this morning, just before we started taping. They haven't practiced this or anything. Are you ready, guys? Jeff is putting on his glasses. I have to put my glasses on so I can read my script. <laughs> so, so Sam, remind me, like, are, is there a specific person that we're playing here? Um, no. So we're going to jump. We have four small scenes. Some of them tie together. I will give a line of intro before we start this. And each one of you, you are each. Oddly enough, playing a single character, not unlike in real life. And I want you to, your direction for these scenes is uh, natural, uh, veritas. Um, uh, think, about, think about man's inhumanity to man and all of our struggles to become both better and worse at the same time. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Sure. And, and don't actors, they ask for motivation, right? My motivation is to get this over so we can close the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That, that's, you know, that's totally fair. And, okay. uh, if you never want to do this again, and by this, oh. I mean this show, that's totally fine. This I may, good. I may have trashed our friendship completely. All right. No, no. So, so we're not a person. Ross isn't Sylvester Stallone and I'm not, um, Burt Reynolds. Well, no. it varies. Right. And oh, I will, okay. I will oh. just, who, the characters don't really matter. I'll introduce okay. it before we go. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay. I'm ready. Scene go. one. This is Stallone and the guy who runs the team. They're talking. Action. You think you can push it to the ragged edge? I can. And the fear? The fear is gone. The fear is never gone. <laughs> <laughs> Scene two. <laughs> Stallone and the team guy again. That was wonderful, guys. Give me more of that. Tap whatever you tapped before. Action. What do you want? I want to apologize. Apologize to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's carry on. Go. <laughs> Why do you even bother talking to this guy? Because I'm the only one who actually... <laughs> say it. You have to say it. Because I'm the only one who actually likes your arrogant ass. Mm. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Excellent work, guys. We're in a groove here. Let's keep going with scene three. It's... it's Come on. It's, don't overdrive the car. It's... it's I'm sorry. You start, I didn't say action, <laughs> Oh, you didn't say action. Sorry. No, that was okay. great though. Carry that same energy. I want more of this. You're doing great. Okay. This is the team guy and a young Jimmy, the young driver. Go. Don't overdrive the car. The suspension is getting loose. Damn it. Don't overdrive the car. <laughs> the rear is drifting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We got one more. We can pull it together and then, then we'll have a wrap party. And by wrap party, I mean, you guys get to leave. Scene four, Stallone and the young Jimmy are talking. Action. Somebody put it in your mind that you got to be perfect every time. Out. Or you're a failure. Well, forget that. Just forget it. I got will and I got faith. And faith, that is like believing in something. Man, it's like having a good disease and winning. <laughs> it's an attitude. So if you trust yourself, <laughs> by the end of the season, you'll either be on top or you won't. But I guarantee you'll know what you're made of. <laughs> I'm I sorry. What, I'm I don't know sorry. what this movie is made of now. Oh, so. oh, <laughs> oh, horse apples. Okay. On that note, that's our show. As always, thank you for listening. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe and tell your friends and eat your Wheaties and chew your vegetables and all the other stuff your mom told you to do not to, to keep your brain from rotting. If you get a chance, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify or the bathroom wall in a gas station where you heard this. That sort of stuff really does help us keep the show going. Our topic next week will be that time Ross and Jeff um, 
Well, they started a band in this small English city in the last century and they got kind of big and then they got really big and everyone was very concerned about the length of their hair for a bit, but that was, that, that was okay because the music was great, except sometimes the music wasn't and there were sitars in it, but we were supposed to like that. We didn't really like it, but we pretended. And then they dressed up like military people for an album cover and eventually they just let it be and it was quit and they were over and everything turned out okay. One of them bought a McLaren F1 and got to be friends with Gordon Murray. Nothing bad ever happened to everyone still alive. They did some great work, uh, some of the greatest musical work in history at the end. That's our show. See you next time. Thanks for listening. Have fun. <laughs>